My name is Shadi Nabhan. I'm with Cardinal Health, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the uh, two chairs of this next session on the inequality or the inequity in access to cancer care, and we're going to uh, hear a lot of examples. So um, first, it's my pleasure to introduce um, uh, Dr. Nancy Davidson, and Dr. Davidson uh, is currently the uh, Executive Director of Clinical Oncology for the Fred Hutch University of Washington Cancer Consortium. Her life's work has centered on advancing research, treatment, and better outcomes for cancer patients. She is a world-renowned physician, scientist in cancer biology and treatment, and I think you've been now here for a year and a half, something like that. And how's the weather? Beautiful. <laughs> So um, Dr. Davidson also was a past president of uh, ASCO, as you learned. She's responsible currently for directing and managing the SCCA's affairs, including planning, organizing, and coordinating cancer care, clinical research, and education. She is focused on uh, breast cancer and serving as a member of the breast cancer team at uh, SCCA. And, uh, um, uh, previous to being uh, here in Seattle, uh, she was a director of the University of Pittsburgh Cancer Institute um, and uh, served as the breast uh, cancer research professor of oncology and founding director of the breast cancer program at Johns Hopkins University. She is a member of the scientific advisory boards for many foundations and cancer centers, member of the National Academy of Medicine, and uh, we discussed the ASCO role and she is a current president of the AACR, as I understand. Past president. Past Just president. Finished. Just <laughs> Sound too happy that you finished, was it, you know. <laughs> and uh, the co-chair of uh, uh, this uh, current session also is Dr. Binay Shah, who you all, uh, if you have not met, then there's a problem. You know, you have. Um, he is the founder and president of the uh, B'nai Tara Foundation. He is a board-certified oncologist and hematologist at Peace Health United uh, General Hospital in Cedro Woolley in Washington. Dr. Shah's area of interest in health outcomes and health disparities among cancer patients. He has published and presented over 125 papers in various journals and meetings. Invited uh, nationally and interna internationally to speak on various cancers and global health. He has the distinction of developing the nation's first statewide personalized cancer care tumor board as president of the Idaho Society of Clinical Oncology. He's a patient advocate and humanitarian, founded the Binetara Foundation to promote health and education in underprivileged communities. I had a chance to talk with uh, Dr. Shah uh, yesterday for a couple of hours, and I truly have been fascinated with the amount of work that this foundation has done. And I believe by next year, we are going to triple the size of the attendees as well as the volume, because it's really an important topic and it's an important initiative. So thank you for what you do and thank you for inviting all of us here. And with all further ado, now you take over. Thanks. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, um, Dr. Rochelle Garcia. And she's going to talk to us about pathology and it looks like in Kenya. Now, she's a really good general surgical pathologist, and she has subspecialty expertise in GYN and breast pathology, both domestically and internationally. Um, currently, she's the professor of pathology and adjunct professor of obstetrics and gynecology and global health at the University of Washington. She's very interested in patient-centered pathology, um, especially in underserved areas, teaching how to practice in a patient-centered and cost-effective way as a diagnostic pathologist, how to communicate reports effectively, to practitioners and to patients, and how to educate and clarify notions about the concept of cancer, of neoplasms, and what is cancer. Um, a big volunteer in Kenya, I think we're gonna hear a little bit about that, um, and somebody who's working to provide a lot of this knowledge to our next generation of pathology um, residents as well. She is a Washington native, graduated from the University of Washington, um, did some internal medicine training, and then somehow you left the field. I don't know how that happened. Um, and went on to complete pathology training in 1994 in town. She's worked at Harborview, she's worked at the VA, she works at the UW Medical Center, um, directed the pathology residency program for 12 years and has been a fellowship director as well. And finally, um, she's board certified in cytopathology and anatomic and clinical pathology, so she's extremely well recognized um, and in, in fact was listed in Seattle Met as one of the top doctors. 
Dr. Garcia. Thank you, Thank you very much, Nancy. I just wondered, are there any other pathologists here? There is. That's great. <laughs> but mostly, so he's the only one who might know if I'm lying about something, I guess. <laughs> So pathology, as I was alluded to earlier about subspecialization, pathology has gotten incredibly subspecialized. So when I'm at, in Seattle, I do mostly breast and GYN pathology at the university and a little bit at the VA, so I keep a little bit of general pathology. But in Kenya, it's doing everything. So that's quite challenging. Um, so I'll just, I have no um, conflicts of interest. So everybody kind of knows a lot of the things that I'm probably going to say today, but the disparity in the income in, and the gross national product in Kenya versus the United States is quite large, and that, of course, influences the access to care. Um, in the healthcare system in Kenya, you have, I don't know if I can use this uh, pointer, but maybe. You have government and private um, hospitals. Most people get their care at the government hospitals. In the private hospitals, there's for-profit hospitals that essentially have care, I think, that's very um, similar to that in the United States. There's non-government hospitals and there's mission hospitals. And the mission hospitals, I would say, provide care that's a bit better than um, the government hospitals, but doesn't have the access to resources, of course, that the private hospitals do. Um, pathology in Kenya, there's two training programs in Nairobi. They have four graduates per year. In contrast, our training program in just the Seattle area, we graduate about eight people per year just for the Seattle area. That is the only training program in the, the Whammy region, which includes Washington, Alaska, Montana. Um, there's about 80 pathologists in the country of 48 million people and about 30 of those practice anatomic pathology. So the discrepancy between patient to pathologist ratio in developing countries like this is even higher than the patient to doctor ratio, which is already huge. There are some African countries that have no pathologist whatsoever, let alone labs. Um, so again, the private hospitals are similar to the United States. The public hospitals, for instance, the University of Nairobi um, have relatively little access to care. And then there's these mission hospitals, which are somewhere in between. And so what do we need to have a pathology department? Well, first of all, you have to have people who can get the specimens, right? A surgeon or a clinician that can get an FNA, et cetera. You need to have a lab that can process the specimens. Um, so you have to have trained histotechs to either cut specimens. Um, you have to have all of the equipment. You need to have some ability to do QA and QC kinds of um, things. And then, of course, you have to ha be able to provide the treatment, which is sometimes something that is, for instance, in Kajabi, where I've been volunteering, sometimes we can get the specimen, and they even have, they have a relatively uh, robust, I guess, formulary of, of medications they can give, but then they have no blood support. So they can't provide care because they can't pr provide blood support. Um, so Kajabi is a mission hospital. It was founded in 1915. It has about 350 beds. There's a five-bed ICU. There are two adjacent pediatric hospitals and an orthopedic hospital right there. It's staffed by a combination of Kenyan MDs trained in Kenya, long-term volunteers, and short-term volunteers. There's only volunteer pathologists. They've tried to hire a pathologist, and they just can't get anyone to agree to stay there. They have interns from the University of Nairobi, and luckily for us, going there, English is used as the medical language. So this is on the way to Kajabi. It's a typical uh, view on the way to Kajabi. I didn't take a picture of the traffic, but the traffic is always horrible. It's a, about 60 miles north of Nairobi, but it takes well over an hour to get there. Um, this is on my way to work here. This is the last part of the road to Kajabi. So one of the problems is just even getting there. Most patients, of course, don't have vehicles. Some patients walk 20 miles to get to the hospital. Um, and the last, however, I think it's about six kilometers on this road is this kind of road. Actually, they recently paved it, but they put such thin pavement on the road that it's already starting erode to erode, and it hasn't even been a year. 
Um, this is the entrance to, to the hospital. You can see there isn't pavement, it's dirt. And when it, when, during the rainy season, that gets quite muddy. Um, that's the entrance to the hospital right there. Let's see if I can, yeah, here. And this is an overhead shot of that complex. Um, they, they do have gar armed guards at the hospital entrance. Um, the pathology department there gets about 4,000 to 6,000 surgical specimens per year from about 30 mission hospitals. Um, they have non-GYN cytology and about 500 PATHs per year. Um, they have one volunteer pathologist, and that pathologist has to do essentially all the work, the, the getting the big specimens and looking at those, et cetera. In contrast, say at the University of Washington, where we have about 30,000 surgicals per year, there they have about three um, techs and one secretary. For our 30,000, I don't even know how many pathologists we have. We have a whole bunch of trainees. We have a whole bunch of people to help with describing the specimens, deciding what's, what, what pieces of tissue to put in. And we have, of course, a whole bunch of support staff, like administrative support, even though we think we don't have enough administrative support. Um, as I said, it's primarily volunteer pathologists. Um, I'm not sure if I should really say this, but it seems to be quite difficult, I think more difficult to get pathologists to volunteer for this kind of work than maybe some other clinicians. So for instance, in Kajabi, you would need 12 people to volunteer for one month a year to, to, to staff the hospital. And some months we can't even get one person to volunteer. And we're, they're, they're, they'll take anyone from you know, the United States, et cetera. Um, if they can't get a volunteer, they hire somebody to do locums for more dollars they can afford, or they send cases out to one of the private hospitals. They've tried pretty hard to, uh, to hire a part-time even Kenyan pathologist, but the, the, the people there can make so much more money in Nairobi that they're not interested in living in this little village. Um, there's no ability to do frozen sections. So, you know, in a, in a hospital like the university or, or most hospitals in the United States, if you are operating on someone and you don't know what they have or you need to know about a margin or whatever, you get a frozen section to help, hopefully, um, guide your operation. Well, they can't do that here, so at the most we can do a um, touch prep. There's been one autopsy in the five, well, now it's been eight, years that I've been volunteering there, we've had one autopsy. Um, so determining cause of death, you know, I think one of the things that's interesting always actually is determining cause of death because so much of what we say somebody died of, we don't have an autopsy. And there's still lots of evidence that autopsies are the only way to really figure out how somebody died. I remember my, when my father died, they put his cause of death like, I forget, whatever it was, I knew that it wasn't correct. I think they put heart failure and it was really renal failure. Um, if you want to consult, there is a, there's a, there's an ability to take photographs, so we can take photographs and send pictures home, but there's no ability to do special stains. So if we get a tumor and we don't know what it is, we might do special stains to try to determine is it carcinoma, sarcoma, lymphoma, which really informs treatment, of course. And, and it's very difficult to get things like prognostic markers for breast um, carcinoma. To, to get a prognostic panel, it only costs $70, which is, here it would be about $1,500, maybe $1,000. Um, and the patient has to come in and pay cash ahead of time to get that sent off, unless the patient can get it enrolled in a study, which there are a couple studies funded by, partially by United States funds. This is on the way to the lab. Usually this hallway is completely full of picture of people waiting. You can see lab here, pathology department there. Um, this is, that's the um, Swahili name for bathroom show. And this bathroom is a hole in the ground. And this is the pathology department right here. And the odor here is always terrible. It's not from the lab though, it's from the bathroom. And then, this is, I think this is, in, no. Stop TB, open windows for air circulation. I want zero TB deaths. Um, we're actually at more risk from getting TB from walking down the hall, though, from the, than from the lab, because most of the things we get are already fixed. But unfortunately, the way they're fixed, oops, sorry, and the way they come, they come in, they, they might come in this package, it's leaking formaldehyde. These are the kinds of bottles, so they can't even get the right kind of bottles, right? We can't even get specimens that don't leak. This is formal and leaking all over the place. And in fact, they don't buffer the formalin correctly, too. The way that most formal formalin that we fix, it has to be, you get con concentrated formalin and then you buffer it with a solution that 
has to be a certain pH and all of that. Sometimes what they do is they put it in pure formalin, but they put less in there because they think, well, if we just put less in and it's not, you know, it'll do just as well. So you get this big, huge thing with this tiny little bit of fixative that doesn't work very well. And of course, this stuff is very toxic. Here's one where they put it in a prenatal vitamin container. Yeah. And this is our um, grossing station. So, you know, we get big, sometimes big, huge specimens. There's this little tiny sink. There's no garbage disposal like we would have in the United States. This is our cleaning sponge. We finally started bringing sponges from home because there's one sponge. There's no cleaning supplies. There's no ventilation. This is the window that you open to, to, to try to get ventilation. And there's this fan. One, one year they moved the fan up here, which actually prevented any kind of ventilation whatsoever, and we had to get them to move it back. Uh, down there. This is one of the residents doing some of the work. She, this is a margarine container that uh, I think it was a breast that was stuffed into there. Yeah. This is my mother who's been going every year and working as a little gross room technician. In contrast, this is the um, University of Washington uh, gross room. So gr the gross room is where we get the specimens and describe them, et cetera. There's lots of good ventilation. Everybody has on, on all this personal protection equipment. There's the fancy computer there. And of course, there's all these containers, which we throw away every time we use rather than reuse containers. This is the staining station at the, in Kajabi. And this is their ventilation. Um, here, most stains are done by an automatic stainer. So you put the slides on and they get on. And frequently, they have automatic cover slips here. But here, it's all done by hand. They do an amazing job with this kind of equipment. Um, here are the techs cutting the specimens. Um, here is one of the techs is putting the slides out on a tray. These trays are all similar to um, what we have. So with minimal equipment, they actually do a really, really great uh, job, I would say. This is one of the residents. We do have a fancy microscope with a camera. Um, so now I'd like to just give an example of a case from there. So it was a 12-year-old male uh, with hypertension, and he had a large left retroperitoneal cystic mass, which was pressing on the kidney, and multiple liver lesions. So they did a liver biopsy, and they were thinking that it was something um, infectious, which makes sense in a 12-year-old, plus you're in Kenya, so you think it's going to be infectious, right? And this is from the biopsy for the, I should ask the one pathologist here. But. So there's this little um, calcified thing, and there's these cells. We weren't sure what they were. If you had this, and there's this little thing, so we're, we were thinking, oh, maybe could it be a gynecoccus? I don't know what it is. And we couldn't do anything else. We couldn't do any special stains. If we were in the United States, we would have done immunohistochemistry to try to identify what kind of cells are those. Are those histiocytes? Are they uh, epithelial cells? If they were epithelial cells, it's probably cancer. But, th but that would be unexpected in a 12-year-old. It was a Kajabi. We had this little tiny biopsy, so we were just descriptive. Then we got the kidney. And this is the kidney. Actually, they said it was retroperitoneal, but this mass is actually involving the kidney. This grossly looks like it's probably cancer, right? And um, this is the histology of that, which isn't too interesting for non-pathologists. But this is the typical clear cell carcinoma, which is actually very rare in 12-year-olds and is associated with um, genetic abnormalities, which they, of course, don't have the ability to determine that. Plus, it was metastatic to um, this is a retroperitoneal lymph node. So I'm not sure what happened to him. Here, of course, he would get treatment. There, he may not have gotten any other um, treatment. Um, so how do we approach cases, whether in the United States or in Kajabi? We, first, we need to decide, is it normal or abnormal? Almost all are abnormal in Kenya, whereas here, most of what we get is normal. Is there a neoplasm or not? Um, I think before going to there, I would have expected that most of what we got was infectious diseases. But actually, most of what you get there is cancer. And it's not pre-malignant processes, like a tubular adenoma or CIN in the cervix or DCIS in the breast. It's like cancer, like invasive carcinomas, and frequently pretty um, advanced. Then we have to decide, is it epithelial? Is it hematopoietic? Is it stromal? And of course, is it, quote, benign or, quote, malignant, whatever those terms mean. But is, so is the cancer the same in the US? And what's different about providing pathology? Of course, cancer statistics depend on our definitions of cancer. So one of my big bugaboos is that, for instance, in the United States, ductal carcinoma in situ counts as cancer. 
in seer data. And that, to me, is not cancer because it's pre-malignant. Whereas a tubular adenoma, CIN3 in the cervix, those things don't count as cancer. If we would count CIN3 as cancer, there would be a lot more cervical cancer. But, and also, it depends on the population, like has already been alluded to here. Is it screened? Is the population screened or not? And do they have access to care so that if they do have a little tiny breast lump, they come in early rather than late? Um, this is a busy slide, but when you look at the incidence of, quote, cancer in the United States, the United States um, is purple, and the, uh, is the, the mortality from cancer is purple, and the um, incidence is green. So if you look, for instance, it's the incidence of breast, quote, cancer in the United States is off this chart. And if you look at the incidence in Kenya, which is blue, it's down here. If you look at the mortality, they look sort of similar. And of course, this is, might not be quite accurate, but part of that is due to screening. And probably pro part of it is, as was talked about earlier, is the fact that there's a big discrepancy in the United States between people with access to care and those without care and how their um, cancer mortality is. And part of this is due to the way we make diagnoses and the way we count them. So of course, we've talked about this the importance of resource allocation. And I think part of it has to do with how much we spend and how much, how do we use those dollars, which I think um, is really important. I notice it all the time just in what I do at work. And the clinical treatments need to guide the diagnostic needs. Um, and of course, all these things that we've already talked about earlier, all these things influence disease incidence and death rate from disease. Um, so I talked about this a little bit either. Already. Um, so the cancer statistics in Kenya, there's not very good data, but invasive carcinoma counts in all organs. In situ, in situ neoplasm is rarely diagnosed in Kenya. Like DCS, you hardly ever get a biopsy with ductal carcinoma in situ. Um, I alluded to this already. The, there, in Kijabi, less than 10% of the biopsies are normal. I would say at UWMC, which is a tertiary carry more center, more than 60% of our diagnoses are normal, essentially and very s small percentage are malignant neoplasms, where more than 50% of the kids' jobbies are um, neoplasms. And this is not an uncommon specimen to get in Kajabi. This would be very uncommon at the university. So this is someone with obviously advanced breast carcinoma. In fact, you probably don't need the pathologist to tell you too much about this, other than maybe you need the prognostic markers, which are the one thing that's hard to get there. She has a big, huge mass that's ulcerated. She's got obvious metastatic disease to her lymph nodes. Um, I'll just quickly go through these. I think I'm about out of time. But, um, so here, these are just some charts of sort of the number of cases of looking at a certain time period, um, percentage of invasive versus other diagnoses. So for instance, with breast cancer in Kajabi, there's obviously way more invasive carcinomas than the UW. And the UW is a primary, is a tertiary care center. So we actually get more invasive carcinomas than you might out in some smaller area. Um, so breast cancer in the US is not as deadly in Africa. I think it probably that's largely due to screening and to bringing in small cancers into the incidence. And we're getting better at treatment, but um, the treatment there is of people with much um, farther advanced um, cancer. This is an example of esophageal. So a certain number of esophageal cancers or cases, biopsies. At the UW, we had no cancers. And at Kajabi, it was mostly cancer. Same thing with the stomach. The red is always the cancers. We, in this number of cases, there were no uh, UW cancers. Same with colon. Same with cervix. You know, cervix, I think we've talked about screening some. I think cervix is the one area where screening obviously makes a huge difference. It's not so clear, I think, in some of the others. But obviously, we still have a lot of cervical cancer there, um, which is what I just talked about. Endometrium, I think this one's kind of interesting, because the endometrium, the incidence of having invasive carcinoma is about the same. And I think that's because people come in for symptoms for endometrial carcinoma. There is no screening um, for that. So what are the limits to pathology in Kajabi and in, in under-resourced countries in general? I think it's not as bad in the United States because you can send things off more easily. There's few personnel, particularly pathologists. There's variable histology, so it's harder to have QA. 
it's harder to get the lab set up. But for instance, the lab in Uganda, I think, some, wherever Renata is, can correct me if I'm wrong, but they have a nice lab there now, but getting a pathologist to staff that lab is problematic. There's no immunohistochemistry. And also there's no computerized record system, so it's harder to get the history. So what they need in general in under-resourced countries, and in Kajabi in particular, they need a consistent pathologist presence. They need some ability to do some IHC, and I don't think we need 250 antibodies like we do here. We could do it with probably 20, um, especially some prognostic markers, like for instance for breast cancer, newer equipment. Um, when we're talking in the more general, general sense about how do you provide pathology services in countries that don't have any pathologists, there's been a lot of talk about doing cytology. I have issues with that. It can be helpful for some things, but you still need somebody to prepare the specimen and somebody to look at the specimens. And coming up with definite diagnosis on cytology is even harder than pathology. And doing prognostic markers, of course, on cytology is nearly impossible. And then telepathology, same thing. We need expensive equipment. We need trained personnel to both prepare the slides and to send the pictures and all of that. And of, of course, neither of those deal with resection specimens like that breast carcinoma or something that maybe is less obvious than that. I would like to thank all the residents who've gone with me. I, I go to Kenya every year for the last several years and usually take a pathology resident with me and hoping that they will become um, motivated to continue, continue with that. And of course, the other faculty in my family. This is a baboon outside my window in Kajabi. <laughs> Any questions? Can you say questions till later? Yeah, Dr. Garcia, okay. thank you. Um, mm -hmm. We'll have question and answer session at the end of this session. So first of all, I would like to invite Dr. Dines Pendarka and Dr. David Avlafia on the stage. Um, so. Our third talk was supposed to be on precision medicine by Dr. Dane Dixon from Idaho. Unfortunately, he had a family emergency. So I'm really thankful to Dr. Abulafia to um, be able to give us a talk at a short notice. Now, I would like to introduce Dr. Ben Tharker, who is going to talk about access to essential medicines uh, in cancer, in, uh, in oncology. Dr. Pendarkar is uh, from India. He is uh, one of the leading oncologists in India and has numerous uh, uh, in, uh, oncology societies. He is also in charge of uh, international program of ASCO, American Society of Clinical Oncology. Um, he has been at the forefront in improving access to cancer care by collaborating with, uh, Briley, can you help uh, with slides, please? Thank you. He has been at the forefront of improving access to cancer care by collaborating with government and with uh, community oncologists. So Dr. Pendarkar, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Binay, for giving me this great opportunity to be with this August audience on discussing essential medical lists. Uh, we all know the basic problem of oncology we've been discussing since morning is actually access, access to care. It may be access to physical care, access to hospital, access to um, medicine, experts. So we can really create great facilities, but unfortunately people, the patients are not able to avail it. And this is really true. Even if you have money, you can't access a hospital. And it's, it's case world over. I b believe it, we do discuss uh, LMICs as an example of uh, non-availability, but problems do exist in every country irrespective. We just heard morning presentations here, and United States has same problem. People may have money, people may have Medicare, Medicaid, Medicare, but still they do not complete their treatment they are not able to access. Somebody in Kenya or in India, they may have a hospital close by, but they have no money to access. So the problems are there everywhere, and the problems, unfortunately, are there for time immemorial. 
I started my career maybe about 35 years back, and believe it, same issues were discussed that time. So I don't think we are actually reaching anywhere. Yes, we have money, we have better drugs, we have better hospitals, we have better physicians, but still problems remain same. And we have to really very seriously think how to resolve these issues. Even you talk of how to deliver health care, uh, every country has a different model. It may be an insurance, it may be a pay by government, like UK, Canada. It may be a mix of both, like India. There may be small insurance, out of pocket, government, everything pitching in together. But everybody is facing some or other problem. So we, as clinicians, we have to really come out with some different model if we really want to increase the excess. I have no uh, disclosures. So when we talk of medication or medicines, essential medicines, there, there, there has to be some list of medicines. You know there's a new, really a new drug coming up daily. Can I afford to give use that drug for every patient I have? No, I cannot. So there has to be some list of medicine which I can and I should have an excess, or I as an individual of the country should have an excess. So we talk of essential medicines. But we have to remember two things. There is a public health care and there is a private health care. So whenever we are discussing essential medicines, we are basically talking of public health care system. We are not talking of a public health care, of a private health care system. I, as an individual, may be able to afford anything I want, but if we have to think at large, at scale, we should probably be focusing on public health care. I do believe that if we really have to do something in oncology, we should focus more on public health care rather than on private health care. So essential medicines are actually the medicines which are crucial for promoting health, and they really form the central pillar of global health and a global uh, issue for a developing agenda. SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, define it as access to safe, effective, quality, and affordable essential medicines and vaccines for all. So this is the goal set up by United Nations, which all of us, all in different countries, have signed this. And it's our goal, it's our aim to achieve this. WHO is one of the world's largest leading healthcare agency. And whatever the country may be, Big or small, WHO serves as a standard of healthcare. So anybody who wants to follow or set up standards for the country, the basic fundamental is a WHO guidelines. And what WHO says about essential medicines are these are the medicines who should satisfy the priority of the healthcare needs of the majority of the population. So the healthcare needs in a country may be different. In the United States, the need may be different. In Africa, in India, it may be different. In India, it might be malaria and tuberculosis as a priority, and maybe not the cancer or something else. In Africa, it may be AIDS as a priority in some countries. So we have to really first prioritize the healthcare. What I want to treat. Is it relevant to my country? Is it relevant to the place I'm using it? And an essential medicine should always be available. If I decide that this is my essential medical list, then it should be available for everybody, for every population, in adequate amount, at an adequate cost, so that an individual can assess it, can access it. It has to be effective and safe, and it has to be cost effective, so that it can be afforded either by the individual or by the organization or the government. The WHO essential medical list really serves as a gold standard. And I, after, once you go through this list, you will really realize if we really want to treat oncology, that list is probably likely to treat 80% of your patients. And I think it's good enough standard for countries like low middle income countries where money is a crunch. And this list is based on prevalent diseases. It is really looking into financial resources. It really considers the drug to be really cheap and effective, 
and cost effective as far as the disease is concerned. It does do consider sometimes the genetic and demographic abnormalities uh, which can, we can encounter in different countries. Lancet Commission last year published a great article on essential medicines for universal health coverage. So the last goal of United Nations was that we should all be able to achieve a universal health coverage for every individual of the world by 2025. So if I have to achieve a universal health coverage, I, being a cancer specialist, I will say I want a universal cancer coverage. That means my government or an individual should be able to pay for the basket of essential medicine. That should be the cost of the drug. I should be able to make that list affordable. I have to assure the quality of the drug, and I have to assure the, that I, I promote the quality of medicines. And we have to really still keeping developing new drugs because, believe it, we have got problem with tuberculosis, which is resistant to all the drugs. We got malaria, not responding to all the drugs available. And if I want to really get eradicate malaria by 2025, or tuberculosis by 2025, I will really not be able to do it unless I put money in developing new drugs. So these are the five aspects on which Lancet Commission did a great job by analyzing this and the history of WHO from the first list from 1977. So they really analyzed everything, whatever happened. Uh, one of the first meetings on uh, essential list happened in probably 1985 in Kenya, and they really reviewed this 30 years, what has gone, ahead and what is happening on these, especially these five points. If we really see there's a huge requirement uh, as far as financing of the drug is concerned, unless we have got this kind of money, we cannot offer a universal health coverage. The per capita financing budget uh, in 2015 was of about 201 drugs, but around dollar 13 to dollar 25 only in low and middle income countries so it's such a low volume of money available to treat diseases and average spend was less than dollar 13 on pharmaceuticals so naturally states should finance health benefits and essential medicines based on this budget so you have to have the drugs which really fit into this cost or we have to make the drugs available in this cost if we really want to cure patients or treat patients. Out-of-pocket expenditure needs to be controlled. And so, so I have to create funds to make essential medicines available, and I have to create institutions and financial organizations like World Bank or IMF to give funds so that people can afford essential medicines. So we have to really create these things as well. So what models we have to do this? Believe it, AIDS was a crisis. The cost of AIDS drugs, I don't have to tell you, it, was, it used to run into thousands of dollars, and it, it has been brought down to only hundreds of dollars by international approach. So WHO approached. There was a special cooperation cre created called Gavi. And through this, they reduced the cost of drugs of, uh, for fighting the AIDS, and they would be able to fight AIDS world over. Same model needs to be created for cancer. Unless I create a Gavi model for cancer, I will not be able to achieve universal cancer care in cancer. Unless we create a global cancer fund, and there's a big movement, especially in Europe, uh, with uh, leaders of ASMO, who are trying to convince all the financial institutions, including World Bank and International Monetary Fund, to create a global cancer fund so like people invested into AIDS, created a huge fund, started buying generic drug, started supplying them free of cost to Africa, that was the only way we controlled AIDS. Unless we created global funds for cancer, we will not be able to even fund essential medicines. So probably this could be the move which could bring down the cost of essential medicines. If we talk of expenditure on essential medicine, 63% of the national healthcare expenditure is borne by people out of pocket. 
And out of this 60%, this is an India data, 42% of the money goes out of pocket in just buying the medicines. Out of about 7% of the Indians go below poverty line every year due to healthcare expenditure. So this is one of the biggest cause of people going into bankruptcy. Same data is there for many countries, including United States. In, Uni U in United States, individuals with cancer are 2.7 times more likely to declare bankruptcy than without cancer. So it's true everywhere. Let's not talk of countries. We are all in the same boat. We are all facing the same problem. So we have to think of cost and affordability, and we have to think of really essential medicine list. If at all, we want to take care of this problem. So affordability is a major challenge, as brought out by Lancet Commission. We have to define mechanisms needed to study the pricing structure, because nobody knows who does the pricing structure. Uh, this, uh, we were just discussing probably yesterday on the pricing structure that the pricing cost of the drug is very high when it is introduced. It continues to rise despite, like Dr. Binay said in the morning, despite all prices, computer prices going down, the drug prices go up. Nobody knows who is controlling this. But I would like to tell you one thing, that I'm into oncology for these many years, and the same discussion I'm hearing for all my life in oncology. So again, my belief is we are not moving anywhere. So if we, I have not moved in the last 35 years, I know in ni next 35 also we will not move unless we start thinking laterally, doing something else. The same discussions probably I, was, I heard in 19, uh, early 90s when ondansetron was in introduced at $1,500 a pill. And same day in India, the pill was introduced. The, it, the, it was introduced in India at that time at about $70, $80 a pill. And in the same night, the same pill was introduced in India at $1 a pill, same day. That was a huge difference. So I don't, I don't say that the $70, $80 was wrong. I don't say the $1 was wrong. But then we have to devise a mechanism to fight it. The same thing continues today. It's not on Dancitron today. It may be like imatinib today, or it may be nivolumab today. But the issues are same. And we are not resolving them. I don't think we will resolve them if we really continue to have the same discussions year after year. So we have to set the, some policies to do this. Problem is the quality. So definitely, you, all of us think that if I produce a low-cost drug, probably it is a low-quality drug. It, believe it, it's not always so. Today in the world, majority of the factories are set up with good manufacturing practices. Majority of the factories world over do follow WHO GMP norms. It may not be a US FDA norm, which is really the best. The best of quality is US FDA. WHO GMP is not the best. But then we have to do something so that WHO GMP grows high to the level of US FDA. National regulatory agencies really need to be standard if I have to improve the quality of life. And we have to really think of logistics and supply chain. Basic, unless I remove that. For example, in India, the drug, the, the retail price of a drug, or I think you call it an AWP in America, it's something for docetaxel, for example, is something like, uh, about $50 to $60. But when it's purchased by the government in bulk, it is just $3. It's a huge cost difference. So where this money is going in between? The money is going on the logistics. The, the company has to supply to the main supplier, who supplies to the retailer, who supplies to the hospital, who supplies to the patient. So if at all we have to reduce the cost of the drugs, we have to seriously think of removing or shortening this logistics chain of drugs to bring down the cost of the essential medicine. And access to care. Even if you create low-cost drugs, if you create a list of essential medicines, if you really make them available, you need people to give it. One of the states in India came up with an idea. In India, in government hospitals, the medical care is free. 
you can walk into the hospital and everything, whatever is available. I don't say it's best of care, but people don't always need best of care. Sometimes you just need a dressing. Sometimes you just need an anti-snake venom. Sometimes you just need a vaccination for hepatitis. You don't need best of care. But these things are available free of cost. So, but to offer that thing free of cost, you need a qualified personnel. So unless we invest into personnel, just investment into drugs is not going to help us. So we need qualified institutions to offer this. And we really have to create an access chain so that the individual can access this low-cost drug and these free facilities. So if our goal as per United Nations is universal health coverage, we have to create minimum system for everybody to access. And then only we'll be really able to meet this challenge of sustainable development goal. Cancer medicines need to be made accessible for everybody. And I personally feel the essential medical list created by WHO is a great thing to really offer access to majority of the population in the world. It has got roadblocks, political, cultural, economic, and there are a lot of legal roadblocks in using and creating that list. So WHO created a special list uh, called yeah, uh, Essential Medi Medical List in Oncology. It was a it really helps me and help everybody else in creating a public health care decision-making mechanism. So it really helps government to decide what to buy. But believe it, not all governments are adherent to it because of a lot of political and social issues. For example, in India, every state has got its own mechanism of drug purchase. So the states have no money, no problem with the money. But then the, last, the list of the drugs we purchase is created by medical officers who are sitting in cancer institutions. They would make this list based on their knowledge of medicine or their interest, quote unquote, vested interest in the medicine. So you may buy nilotinib for treatment of uh, CML, but you may not buy imatinib for the treatment of CML because it be, it's based on that individual. So in a situation like this, if I'm able to convince the state that you should stick to EML or essential medical list of oncology, that would really help me. So I personally feel EML list of oncology by WHO is a great effort done by many, many people, many, many organizations, uh, especially UICC, ASCO, everybody brought together. And it, it, it is a great move. And fortunately, in this list, we have associated the drugs with the disease, so you know which drug to purchase and where it should be used. And it really helps in national purchasing. It probably will help. I'm not able to go through in India. It's, it's really a challenge for me. I've still not been able to convince the government that we should stick to that list. But I think that's a great thing what at least other low and middle income countries can do. And it will encourage the pharmaceutical industry to reduce the pricing. Because if I know I'm, I am definitely likely to sell this amount of drug, the pharma industry would be able to really reduce the drug because they know they are selling minimum amount. So because naturally, a costing for a pharma industry is important. And if the volume is huge, the unit price can be reduced. So this is a list which controls about 22 adult cancers with seven pediatric cancers. And this is the huge list of about 50 drugs. It practically covers everything. You are actually able to control 80% of the diseases with this list. I, I think, I see, today 100% are dying without, a, uh, without drug. So if tomorrow 20% die without drugs, I'm still happy because I'm actually curing 80% of the patient. What my individual suggestion would be, we have to have settings where we should approve the drugs. I personally feel, instead of fighting for the cost of the drugs, we should fight for the list of the drugs. Because if the setting is new age one, that means it's a potentially curable patient, all drugs should be approved. If it's an age one setting, I know it's a curable patient, all drugs should be approved irrespective of the cost. If it's a metastatic de novo setting, when the patient has come for the first time, it, he has a right for some treatment, probably all drugs should be approved. But if we are talking of a metastatic second line setting, 
we have to be really very careful whether the drug should be approved. I'm talking of a public health care, not private health care. Because if the resources are limited, we have to seriously think of approval of second line metastatic drugs for public purchase. I think if we adhere to these guidelines, we will be really able to save a lot of money to really treat patients who are curable. Hematology and pediatric, they're curable cancers. So probably we should spare no effort in getting the drugs approved for hematology, for pediatric malignancies. So I, besides the cost of the drugs, which we fight daily in and out, I think we should put another standards in calculating what drug should be approved and what not. Definitely most common cancers should be taken into account. What the disease causes a public health problem should be taken into account for like, like for India, Head and neck cancer is a problem. 40% of our cancer is head and neck. And there is no drug available to treat head and neck cancer. So probably my research should go into head and neck. My money should go into helping head and neck cancer patient rather than, rather than other diseases. Cervix cancer. <coughs> I will just tell you a very small dilemma about cervix cancer. We just heard that we're fighting world over, especially in Africa, Everybody is spending a lot of money in vaccinating children, girls, for uh, cervical cancer. In India, also there is a huge movement that cervical vaccine should be approved for a national vaccination list, which is a, it is not in India. So now it's a very, very serious question. Incidence of cervical cancer in America is something like 7, 7.4 per 100,000 population. Incidence of cervical cancer in India, in majority pockets, not all, is 7 per 100,000 population. So if without vaccination, my incidence is same with vaccination in your country, do I really need that vaccination? I don't have that money. So I have to really seriously think when I need a vaccination. My incidence rate of cancer in India is 90 per 100,000 population. Against United States, I think 300 plus. So I, do I have to re really follow the race America is following? I have to really very seriously think. It's easy to say, do cervical vaccination for everybody, United Nations program, WHO charter, or whatever it is, or do PSA for everybody or do mammography for, my incidence of breast cancer is much less than America. Do I follow America and do mammography for everybody and increase my rate of breast cancer? I'm still happy with whatever incidence I have. It's much lower than what you have. S same with prostate cancer. So you know that there's a debate in America on PSA, there's a debate in America on mammography. So what I, my plea is, we as cancer researchers also have to seriously think of when we advocate these guidelines of early cancer detection, we should put this data also in mind. And believe it, somebody may say my registry may be faulty. We have registry in India from 1945, which is really working very well, and it is, it's fairly a good registry. So I cannot just blame that there is no data collection in India, so my incidence is low. I don't believe that. So uh, we have to really seriously think on these issues before taking the calls. So how do I decide which drug is good or bad? There had been multiple uh, guidelines on that. There are multiple solutions to this. There's an ESMO magnitude of clinical benefit scale to assess whether a drug should be included in public uh, healthcare system or not. There's an ASCO value framework. There are NCCN uh, formulas to calculate which drug is worth it or not. Nice guidelines are there, in, uh, especially in UK, to purchase a drug or approve a drug. So definitely the oncology community is trying to assess this every drug based on its value. And these differences will exist from country to country. Let them exist. But these differences really may be recalculated based on the country. For example, Jefitinib is not included in WHO list of uh, essential medical list. Today, for, but for India, for example, today I have a capacity of doing EGFR mutation 
practically in all metro cities in India, literally close to free of cost. And I have Jeffidinib available to me at a cost of, uh, I would say, $30 per month, which a patient can afford, and my government system can afford to give it free. So probably Jeffidinib for me, in an, as an essential medical list for India, should be included into the list. So the EMO list, uh, the EML list of oncology for various countries can definitely be regulated based on what your country wants and what are your capabilities. So it's cost effective for India, so probably I would like to add Jeffitinib into my list of essential medical list. Similarly, doxorubicin and epirubicin cost similar in India. There is no difference. For, and so epirubicin is not included in uh, the list of WHO oncology list. But the cost of drugs in India is absolutely similar. So probably India can include the epirubicin in the, uh, the list. So these small issues should be considered when we really go into the details of WHO essential medical list. But probably that is the list. It's an excellent list. It's a great effort by all international oncologists and should form a standard of care. Dr. So, Dr. we have one minute left. Yeah, so I, so I also have one minute. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we have an essential medical list available. We have a patient available, but we have no way to deliver it. So you may have all the drugs available in India, or in Africa, but I don't have an oncology workforce. So somebody really said in the morning, the issue is creating an oncology workforce. So I have been working on it. Uh, in creation of an alternative workforce in oncology. Uh, the issue is existing here. You know there are no oncologists in America. There is a scarcity of oncologists. There are no oncologists in Africa. There are no oncologists. But this is there for the last so many years. And this probably will happen for next so many years. So unless you design an alternate strategy. So I have designed an alternate strategy of an innovative healthcare. And these are the four states which I have marked here where I am running an alternate state. Every district of this place and the total area is, I think, something like 800,000 square kilometers. And the total population cover is something like 210 million. A patient can walk into the government district hospital and will be taken care for cancer. He'll be appropriately counseled, appropriately directed to some nearest cancer facility, will be offered a palliative and a supportive care, and will be offered anti-cancer drugs free of cost in these 125 district hospitals of India through the government, where the government is pitching in. This, we are practically following list close to the EML list of oncology. So there's an alternate oncology workforce which I have been able to create in these uh, states. And uh, this model is unlikely to go to another states now. So this is the model. You create a nodal district, nodal cancer unit in a district hospital. So we create a physical facility we make the medical team with a short training. We empower this, uh, this unit by 24 by 7 backup using various techno mentoring technologies, including tumor boards, WhatsApp, telephone. We go physically there and do camps and activities. We have established systems there and chemotherapy delivery models there. And our output is counseling, care, chemotherapy, public education, and advocacy. These outcomes, they have been reported uh, they, this has been audited by multiple agencies, including few, few visitors from uh, US, has been reported in ASCO Connection. This all has been reported somewhere. In last year's ASCO Education book, I have an article on empowerment of oncology alternate workforce. I have a video on ASCO virtual meeting, which you can visit. The whole idea is not to create only essential medical list, but to create a delivery system so that we can actually reach the cancer patients. Thank you very much. That was an outstanding talk. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, invite those of you st uh, who are standing in the back to the front. There are multiple chairs available. And uh, secondly, so we have these uh, copies of Hippocratic Oath. So many times as physicians, after when we graduate from med school, well, well all of us have to take this Hippocratic Oath. But when we start practicing, we may forget. Or we may never uh, end up going back to it. So uh, our partners, Anti-Cancer Research Journal, that publishes all of our abstracts, they are based out of Greece. 
and uh, their impact factor is two. So they ended up sending us uh, a number of copies of this Hippocratic Oath for all of our attendees. So please collect them from registration desk, and uh, it is nice to, it is in Greek language, so I would not understand it, <laughs> but it is nice to have it in our office as a reminder. <laughs> And now I would like uh, Dr. Davidson to introduce next topic. We're really fortunate for the last speaker in this session that we're going to hear from Dr. David Abulafia, who's going to talk to us about AIDS-related malignancies and inequitable access. Um, he's a section head in the Department of Hematology and Oncology at Virginia Mason here in town. And he's an investigator at the Virginia Mason Community Clinical Oncology Program and SWAG, very active in the AIDS Malignancy Consortium chair of the AMC Outreach, um, Education, Recruitment, and Retention Committee, and also a clinical professor of medicine in the Division of Hematology um, at the University of Washington. So since 1992, um, he's been the medical director of the Bailey Bouchai House in Seattle, uh, which provides care to people with HIV, promotes health, well-being, and functional independence. Um, and the goal is to make sure that every person with HIV AIDS in our community has equal access to positive outcomes. This group emphasizes acceptance of all people compassion, safety, and dignity, and the autonomy of individuals. Um, David also serves on the University of Washington Center for AIDS Research, the CIFAR Committee. He's a member of the HIV Medical Association and the International Association of Physicians for AIDS Care. David, very important topic. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much for um, introducing me. It's interesting. I relate to a lot of the people in this room, even though I don't know many of you personally. And I feel like six degrees of separation. My brother is a uh, Onco a surgical oncologist in Baltimore and runs a cancer center there, so I relate there. Um, we heard from a speaker from Chicago, and my niece trained at Cook County, and one of my best friends works as the oncologist at Cook County, and indeed, the access to care there is much like a third world country. And um, I was thinking about the difficult way our patients navigate through our system, challenges with um, super enormous prices of uh, drugs for our oncology group. And I was reflecting how in India they did develop, they were really the first to develop generic drugs for HIV, which was a huge game changer for the entire world. And then finally I kind of lamented about access to the podium trying to get here today. Um, Seattle is growing so quickly that even just for me to drive from home to, to get to here, a place that is literally uh, half a mile from where I walk, I was going in crazy circles through, um, through the city, trying to navigate through cranes and stuff like that. So I think it's really interesting when we talk about inequities to care and we think about some of the barriers that we talk about for urban versus rural, those who have wealth and those who don't, racial issues. We don't always think about sexual and gender minorities, and that's a really new area and perhaps for the next conference worthy of a discussion. But I'm going to concentrate on HIV, and I think one of the things that I wanted to say was that I started my career at a time when I saw much more HIV as an intern and resident than I ever did of community-acquired pneumonia. And in fact, the first patient I took care of as an intern was a young man, same age as me as an intern, who was developing acute respiratory distress syndrome. And I literally had no idea what to do. I was getting blood gases him through the night as he was getting worse. And finally, I got weak. I called my chief resident who came rushing in, whisked the guy over to the intensive care unit, and he died the next morning. And I remember we snuck in. We were going to present this case at residence report. And I remember sneaking into our library, it was locked at night, and looking up something called pneumocystis gerovici pneumonia. I couldn't even say PJP at that time. And that's what this patient had. And of course, by the time I'd done with my internship, I had seen hundreds of patients die from that pneumonia, not knowing yet how best to treat it. So what I'm going to do is talk to you about the burden of HIV and cancer and this kind of overlapping connection between them. And for sure, as people with HIV are living longer, as you'll see in a minute, we're seeing more and more cancers in this group. Not the unique type KS lymphomas, cervical cancer, which were AIDS defining, but rather those that come with aging. So colon, prostate, breast. And so as we think about access to those kind of issues, think about adding one more barrier, which is just HIV. 
Um, I think that um, there's very little research in this area when we look at the nexus between HIV and cancer. And this is just becoming a, a focus for ASCO, for the NCI, and other groups, too. And for sure, we need a lot more research in this area. So um, I think some of you may have seen this uh, lead article, or this review article that was in the New England Journal about a month ago. And in the USA, as of 2010, um, there were an estimated nearly 8,000 people who were diagnosed with cancer. And this is 50% higher than the general population. And the reasons for that are obvious, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, but it's also true that these patients have significantly less um, treatment provided them than in general oncology population. And um, this disparity in care where the research is just beginning is enormous. And I wanted to say that antiretroviral therapy, which was really generic antiretrovirals, which was started in India, has been an incredible game changer. And so when I started my career, everyone died from AIDS. Anyone who was HIV infected ultimately was going to die. And I remember really distinctly in 1993 driving to Bailey Boucher, and I was listening to the sports channel, and they announced that Magic Johnson had just been diagnosed with AIDS. And I was like absolutely shocked. I came from Michigan. I had followed his career in Lansing at Michigan State. And I just was like, I pulled over the road, and it just hit me really hard. It's like, oh my god, Magic is going to die from AIDS. And of course, Magic is one of the most wealthy people in the United States right now. He now is the major owner for the Los Angeles uh, Lakers, and he is a huge um, spokesman for HIV, too, although not necessarily appreciated in the uh, sports community. Um, this article took place in 2000, oops, let me, in 2008 in the New York Times, and it was a discussion around uh, people with HIV were now living to normal life expectations because of the amazing benefits of HIV medicines. And as they were beginning to age, they were aging at a higher rate with higher comorbidities. And it was really um, a big question for this very disparate community, but most of them who were poor and on the fringes of our society, how they were going to get their care. Um, and it's no secret that um, as a population, HIV-infected patients have much higher incidences of all of these comorbidities that, continue, that contribute to um, poorer health, but also significantly higher risk of cancer. And when we talk about cancer control and disparity in care and access to expensive medicines and programs that really require infrastructure, we really also need to think about cancer screening and what are the factors that contribute so heavily to cancer and how we get those patients into those programs because obviously the best pa patient is a patient who never gets cancer, not one who we have the resources to care for when they get it. So 40 to 60 percent of these folks um, are smokers and we know the link between comorbidities and lung cancer and other malignancies with smoking. <coughs> Uh, recreational drug use, particularly in urban, but also in rural areas, are enormous problems right now. A couple years ago in Broward Con County, India, <laughs> India, Broward County, Indianapolis, um, <laughs> in Indiana, um, we heard that there were, uh, in a small community in the course of six months, over 200 people seroconverted with HIV, and crystal meth and other drugs, Opana was one of them, was the nexus between dirty needle sharing and that, and that is a huge epidemic. Next Friday for Grand Rounds, I'm gonna be talking about pre-exposure prophylaxis, and that's a whole new concept of how do we prevent HIV. Um, and of course, alcohol in my population, 50 to 70%, and all of the links between alcohol and that. Um, there's also no secret that aging is a risk factor for cancer, and everyone in this room is one day going to be a patient, and that's a sobering thought as we think about our health care system and where it's going. But if you look at colon cancer, the difference between 25 and 75 is over a hundredfold higher incidence in cancer. So really a very obvious connection between aging, acquired mutations, and risk of cancer. Um, these two slides are only there to make one point or two points. The first one is that 
the HIV population is aging. And in 2012, we hit a milestone when the median age of the HIV-infected patients in the U.S. hit 50. So when we think about breast cancer and colon cancer screening, that was the median age. And it's been interesting for me to go from uh, a group that I started caring for in my internship and residency who are now the same age or older than me and are running into all the kinds of typical non-AIDS defining cancers that we think about with aging. Um, the other thing that I wanted to do on the bottom slide is just say that as HIV meds have done such amazing things in terms of radically changing the natural history of HIV disease, we're seeing more non-AIDS defining cancers than AIDS defining cancers. So what are those cancers? Head and neck cancer is a big one right now. Anal cancer is a huge issue right now. Um, breast and colon and prostate cancer are becoming bigger and bigger issues, and for sure lung cancer is an enormous cancer. And worldwide, the link between hepatitis B, HIV, and cirrhosis, and ultimately hepatomas is really quite something too. So as of right now, more people develop and die from AIDS-related cancers, and AIDS-related cancers are the number one cause of death for people living with HIV. Um, this is a slide that just shows um, the various manifestations of KS. I won't belabor it. Um, this is treatment that can get better just with highly active antiretroviral therapy. 80% of patients who get started on HIV meds can have this shrink and often go away without the need of chemotherapy. Of course, when it gets into the lungs or when it's causing woody lymphedema on the legs, that's a huge problem. When in Africa, um, where the cancers come at a much higher rate, as they do in Cook County in, in Chicago, we're seeing this kind of chaos, not the kind of chaos I see in my clinic. Um, there's also a variety of lymphoproliferative disorders that are associated with HIV and AIDS. And in the early days of the epidemic, it was diffuse large B cell lymphoma and Burkitt's lymphoma. But we now appreciate other variants primary effusion lymphoma, plasmacytic, uh, plasmablastic lymphoma, which are associated with a different virus called HHV8. So this is a cancer registry, which comes, a really quite a large one, which comes out of California. And it just points out the higher incidence of KS um, and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in the HIV community. But as you can see here, anal cancer, which is a relatively rare cancer um, in the United States, is disproportionately um, associated with this group. And Hodgkin's disease um, is somewhere around the same as lymphoma, even though it has never been considered an AIDS-defining illness. Um, across bigger data sets, you can see larger links between HIV and KS. And if you look at um, the second column, you can just see the standard incidence ratios, or the incidence of KS, lymphoma, and some of these other cancers as they pertain to HIV. And again, this is a community that has a disproportionate link between immunodeficiency and cancer. And one of the things that I get asked a lot nowadays is, why are you seeing HIV patients? And you know, where I trained, which was in Los Angeles, um, when I was in the middle of my training and certainly into fellowship, 40 to 50% of HIV-infected patients were destined to develop cancer. And in those days, the barriers for HIV-infected patients to get even compassionate care in our medical centers was enormous. And our group, the hematology oncology group, because so many of these patients were dying from cancer, took up that mantle and were treating those patients, working with hospice, um, giving them chemo, often regimens that hastened their death rather than alleviated their suffering or extended their survival. And that was my beginning in this epidemic. Um, when I came to, the, to, to Seattle, I started seeing HIV primary care as a gateway, knowing that many of those patients were eventually going to get cancer. So this is another one that looks at, um, with the exception of um, cervical cancer, non-AIDS-defining cancers. And I think what's really interesting here is that breast and prostate cancer are not highly linked to HIV, and in fact, in many of the data cancer registries, there's lesser risks of breast cancer in HIV-infected women. And the same goes for prostate cancer. But if you think of the nexus between 
African-American and prostate cancer. And if you think of that graph of, I showed, I highlighted colon, but it's the same overlapping graph for breast cancer. As these patients now live to normal expectation for survival, those are clearly the non-AIDS defining cancers that we're most focused and concerned about. So um, clearly the burden of cancer is large and it's growing larger in this group. And as of 2017, it's the leading cause of death for people with HIV infection. Um, we know that people living with HIV and cancer are less likely to get uh, standard treatments than their HIV negative cohorts. And there are a lot of reasons for that, and they overlap with all of the presentations we've heard uh, right now. Access to care, um, well-trained pe well people who know how to take care of the nuances of HIV and cancer care, um, disparities that come with race and social class, um, and even insurance status and just navigating their way around the healthcare system when they're not used to accessing that care is really, um, a, really a big concern. And of course, if we can do our best, quality of life and, and indeed um, survival would be extended in this group as we expect that it would in the general population. Um, there have been a number of studies, and I won't go through them in detail, but just to say that when we've looked at things like lung cancer, we know that patients are less likely to get chemotherapy for lung cancer, and that their survival is less too um, than their HIV negative cohorts. The same is true for other cancers, and it doesn't just extend to lymphoma, but to breast and prostate cancer too, which are clearly becoming the dominant cancers in this group, along with anal cancer, along with liver cancer, and for sure, head and neck cancer. Um, the reasons for these um, disparities of care are assumed, but they haven't been studied well yet. There is one researcher at the NCI, who, uh, funded by the NCI, who works out of uh, Duke University now, who is doing a lot of work in this area, trying to uh, screen out things like um, disparities related to drug use or related to a low immune status or related to the physical challenges of getting into a clinic from a rural area of North Carolina to a central area in Duke or something like that. Um, and I think one of the additional options is that we don't always know what is the best care for HIV-infected patients. There is some assumptions that their immune system may be different. Maybe they'll tolerate certain drugs differently. And there haven't been a large number of studies looking at HIV and cancer other than KS or other than lymphoma. Um, and then there's a lot of other things that we can well imagine that can contribute to that. And finally, there have been very little in the way of guidelines to help us. And I think particularly as we talk about um, general oncology versus super subspecialty oncology, which I think is a huge strain for us as a country right now, and even in, we heard even in Washington State, we increasingly rely on things like NCCN guidelines, which have been largely absent for HIV patients. Um, there was an interesting survey that was published in um, Journal of uh, Oncology Practice a year and a half ago which just surveyed oncologists and radiation therapists in the United States. And they had actually a very large number of people um, turn out for this survey. It was, I think, about 400. And basically what they said was that roughly 20% of those who were surveyed said they felt that the treatments for the HIV-infected uh, folks a priori would be, should be very different than that for the, for the other folks. And that standard of care did not apply for one reason or another. And what they found also was that the folks who were most comfortable about talking about prognosis, who were most comfortable with background information about HIV, were the most adept at least offering those patients, quote, standard of care, not just any care. Um, and then, of course, how you're insured makes an enormous issue of what kind of treatment you get. Just as in India, if you can afford private insurance versus the government insurance or the, the free government care, the standards are incredibly different. Um, so we know now that HIV-infected patients have an inferior survival to their non-HIV-infected patients um, with cancer, even though those who have HIV infection who don't have cancer have an expected survival that rivals that of their HIV-negative counterparts. 
Um, they're four times less likely to receive treatment, and this definitely contributes to their, their iniquity with survival. And these factors are complex, and they're complex as we talk about urban versus rural, um, entitled versus not, resources versus those that don't. And one of the things that's been a real challenge for HIV patients and for me and the AIDS Malignancy Consortium is really the lack of clinical trials. And fortunately, the NCI has funded a very small group. It's not a lot of money, but the AIDS Malignancy Consortium. And increasingly, those dollars are now being directed toward um, third world countries, and as well as Brazil. And I think Brazil is going to have uh, several new centers that are going to be partic uh, participating in the AMC in the next one or two years. We've also, also done work with India, and for sure now our focus has been in Africa. Um, so this was, of course, something that caught my eye. It was, a lead, it was an important article in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. And this is the Friends of ASCO initiative. And they basically looked at um, what are the barriers to clinical trials enrollment. In a, world, in, a, in a country of plenty, we do a very poor job of enrolling patients in clinical trials. And in, almost across the line in our clinical trials in the US, one of the ex exclusion criteria is HIV seropositivity. That's an automatic game stopper. Um, and so the um, ASCO group and the NCI have been trying to open up inclusion criteria. Originally, these inclu ex inclusion exclusion criteria were really designed to protect patients. We didn't want to make them worse. But as a result, we've limited our ability to enroll certain populations who are a priori screened out of those things. So HIV is a big one, but you could think of brain meds. Most of our clinical trials forbid patients with brain meds to participate. Others have issues around liver function or renal function, even though the drugs we may be studying have no effect on the kidney or the liver. So there's really an, a strong effort right now um, among various large cancer groups to really identify what are the true things that make sense for allowing people in and out of uh, trials. Um, we actually wrote a, a response to that article in JCO, um, which was very well um, replied to, I thought. But um, there's a researcher, um, Morale Janakaram, at, uh, in the Bronx who looked at the lymphoma, um, how many of his lymphoma patients actually were able to get on AMC clinical trials at a site that had AMC funding. And it was ridiculously low. I think of the 70 patients with lymphoma that they saw, only about 12 were able to get on. And the biggest exclusion was hepatitis B or hepatitis C, even though we know that those things were not going to make a difference in the treatment protocols that they were being offered. Or if they did have those, that we could suppress their HBV with a simple pill. So I think even within our AMC, we've been trying to look over what are boilerplate inclusion and exclusion criteria. So the NCCN has come up with some new guidelines for how to treat Kaposi sarcoma. Um, they have guidelines in place since 2014 for how to treat lymphoma patients. And as we begin to make stronger efforts to publicize those guidelines, as the NCCN develops new guidelines for patients with HIV and cancer, this is going to make a difference, we think. Um, one of the things that um, they emphasize in their guidelines, and which came out in the Friends of ASCO uh, white paper, was that there are important nuances that need to be aware of when we're treating these populations, and particularly prophylactic medications to reduce the incidence of infections, and definitely the drug-drug interactions are complex, and if you have a pharmacist that you can work with, you're really much better off. Um, this one also is really important, and I think in our center we're wrestling with it right now. How do we give adequate care to sexual and gender minorities? I think this is the group who are, set, are experiencing incredible disparities in care, and they have a much higher incidence of cancer than the general population, and a much higher incidence of HIV in this population, too. We know that um, transgender women have a much higher incidence of breast cancer. They also have a much higher incidence of lung cancer. Cervical cancer screening, there's no guidelines for uh, a man who changes his um, sexual identity to female, but we need to begin to think about that. 
um, we're beginning to think about how to reach out to this community for anal cancer screening, which is a huge, huge problem. So um, there are evolving recommendations. Um, most patients with HIV and cancer should get whatever is considered standard of care, with very few exceptions, even we know, though we know those don't always happen. Um, it's ideal if the oncologist can partner with an HIV specialist. Um, just as a cancer doctor who sees general cancer needs to partner with a subspecialist when he sees a tumor outside his comfort zone, um, we really have to rely on our infectious disease colleagues to give us idea of what is the expected survival for that person, are the drugs that we're going to do cause more harm or good vis-a-vis -vis the HIV meds that they're taking. Um, and then again, if you have an expert pharmacist, this is becoming a really important issue in HIV. How do you manage um, co-drug administration with complex anti-oops, antiretroviral therapy? So I, how much time do I have? Oh, okay. I'm going to really wrap this up quickly. I was hoping to show a video, but I think one of the key things is like, how do we prevent cancer? And you know, we're focused right now on how do we get our cancer patients into care, but can you imagine what the impact would be if we stopped smoking um, in, in, in all of our countries? The reason there's such a high incidence of head and neck cancer in India is because of uh, smokeless tobacco and smoking tobacco, and the interplay between viruses and infection like HPV, which we do a terrible job in the USA of vaccinating um, kids between the ages of 9 and 15 or 9 and 13 and up until the age of 22. Um, there's also no guidelines that tell us how we should best screen lung cancer. We know what the, end, what the guidelines are and what insurances will now cover, but much higher incidence in this group. And we're just beginning to tackle this issue, knowing that there are going to be a higher incidence of false positives when we start doing lung cancer screening. Um, so last, uh, last slide, um, you know, we've, or I'm going to go from here. Um, the ACRE trial is an incredibly important trial. It's funded by the NCI. It came out of a gastroenterologist from an infectious disease specialist at UCSF. But it's an effort to determine whether anal cancer screening can change the natural history of anal cancer in the U.S. And this is a huge project. We were really for fortunate to get funding from the NCI after a really a career effort on this person's um, to get this recognized. But it's going to be screening 17,000 men and women over the age of 35, HIV positive, and looking to see if anal PAPs, which are just like cervical PAPs, and high resolution endoscopy, which is exactly like colposcopy. Um, will change. We know that it works for cervical cancer. We don't know if it'll work for anal cancer. And we're going to see how well we do with this. The next slide was going to be a six minute video. And I'm not going to change it, but uh, I would invite it. Okay, all right. For, well, I'll stop there and uh, say thank you very much. Um, I, you know, sometimes we're left with good options and not so good options, kind of like this guy here, and you're going to be damned if you do and damned if you don't. But there are so many challenges as we think about how to get through good care, access to care, what is the most important, is it a cancer screening or is it a drug that's affordable? All these things are so great and I'm really happy we have a forum like this to discuss it. Thank you very much. Thank you. These are three outstanding talks, and I would like to invite uh, questions from audience. Thank you. I'll, I'll start. Um, so we talked a lot about, you know, since the session is about uh, inequality of access, when it comes to designing clinical trials, I still think that clinical trials are being designed to get just the cream of all patients, the best organ function no comorbidities, often they're younger. And most clinical trials are being designed even here or abroad with the novel agents require serial biopsies every 10 days sometimes after you give a novel drug to look at immune changes and all of these and then another month afterwards and to get another cycle you have to get another biopsy. 
I mean, these are very difficult for patients who have uh, transportation issues and who live uh, very far from academic sites. So how do we reconcile? What are the solutions to try to design clinical trials that are really reflective of the real people who um, are living in the real world as opposed to the 5% who are absolutely the best? Thanks. Um, you know, I really res <laughs> that question really resonates with me. Um, in the AMC, we've been very guilty of that. We've had KS trials where patients were supposed to come in every four weeks to get a KS biopsy, and we couldn't enroll patients for that reason. The exclusion criteria around hepatitis B and C, which no longer exists for our group, was a huge barrier, and the NCI has often thought about defunding us because um, we were not getting enough patients into clinical trials. Um, I think these efforts, those couple slides I showed you, are real, real significant efforts to make um, research trials that are applicable to real patients and don't put more burdens on them. I think when you think of all of the PK studies we do, and we do a lot of them in our AIDS trials because we're looking at drug-drug interactions with HIV meds, most of our patients think about it and say, no, thank you. So I totally agree with you. It's a huge problem for oncology. And it's something that I think that we're beginning to think about, but it's still a challenge. Yeah. I think one of the issues could, one of the things which we can really help in trials is probably somewhere down the line we have to change the, the laws we use for clinical trials, and especially the compensation laws. For example, in India, we were doing extremely well with clinical trials about three years back. And three years back, all of a sudden, all trials stops because the compensation laws for clinical trials changed for no reason. Nobody knows why. And we now only we are re-emerging to redo the clinical trials. So I think we as a clinical community who design clinical trials have to seriously talk to the regulatory authorities to change the laws of compensation, number one. Number two, we should definitely try to do the trials where there are patients. For example, if you really want to do a trial on AIDS uh, or HIV and anal cancer, I think the best place is Africa. I know a place uh, like uh, uh, Western Kenya, Eldoret, where I think uh, Indiana University is working with them and Empath is working with them. They've got 70,000 patients on roll with them. They see 70 to 100 Kaposhi sarcoma patients per week in an oncology clinic. So probably if we have to design a trial of 5,000, just an examination for uh, early anal cancer detection, probably that's the address we should target, for example, and you can have really, really gather the data much faster. So we have those trials going on in Africa right now and in India as well, and so those are questions that will speed things around, although, again, the differences in access to care in, in those countries in the U.S. mandates that these kind of studies be done here. Ironically, you know, we have a KS trial that's just getting off in Africa. The drug is pomalidomide, and when you think about how much pomalidomide costs, it's about $10,000 a month. And so, again, fundamental issues that need to be fixed with this, with this model of what does SCCA do to address these issues? The SCCA, I think all of us are working to address these issues. I, I want to point out what David said, which is that there is a big national effort right now to look at all of these eligibility criteria. You know, the other one that frequently excludes people is having had one cancer. Well, to me, that's crazy. You know, usually those are the people you think that you definitely want to make sure are involved in trials. So I think the FDA in the U.S. is taking a leadership role on this with a variety of organizations, and we're going to see some loosening or the uh, changes in these eligibility criteria. The other thing I think everybody is thinking about is clinical trial designs. You know, how can you do it more efficiently? How can you target, as you just talked about, you talked about geographic targeting of patients, um, go where the, the money is. Um, but, but the same thing could be true for some of the targeted therapies that we have that you really focus down on patients in need, and perhaps with biomarker-directed uh, trials that might be a little bit less arduous for the patient if we had really good surrogate markers. We have a lot of questions, though, so how about the next one? Hi, um, I'm from Fort Worth, Texas, and um, 
I spend so much time on my soapbox there that I had to come to another state to get on a new one. Um, I have been an oncology nurse for 25 years, and right now I run a uh, nonprofit uh, cancer uh, survivorship clinic out of Fort Worth. We're part of the UT Southwestern system. Um, we're under 1115 waivers, so we're able to provide support services at no charge to uninsured cancer patients. One of the roles we have recently absorbed in the community is navigating uninsured patients to treatment because um, particularly in Texas, if you do not live in a safety net hospital county or are uh, undocumented, there is little chance you're going to get cancer treatment. Um, so I've kind of created this, I call it my underground railroad of cancer treatment where we have uh, providers that are willing to do things at cost and for payment plans for our patients. But um, my question is, there's a lot of talk about screening here for cancers, and we do a great job of screening for cancers in Texas as well. And how do we reconcile that with not having access to treatment once we find a cancer? And that seems that to me is an ethical issue too, that we're screening all these people with very little criteria, but then we find a cancer and we have no way to provide treatment for them. So basically, we just told somebody how they're gonna die. Um, and that's my big issue. For BCCS in Texas, you can be undocumented and get screening for BCCS. Um, However, if you're found with a breast or cervical cancer, you're not eligible for the MBCC, the Medicaid for breast and cervical. So even at the state level, we can screen for a cancer, but we're not gonna help them get treatment for a cancer. Yeah, no, I think that's a really important point. I'm not sure we have an answer for that here, but I couldn't agree with you more that screening has to be tied to access to treatment. I, I'm hoping though, the way you said that you're screening for everything, I'm hoping that you're using really evidence-based guidelines for the relatively few cancers that we screen for. Uh, welcome to Seattle, where everyone can have their own soapbox. <laughs> we, um, I, I agree with Nancy, and I, of course, agree with you. It's a real challenge. Evidence-based screening is one thing, and screening is another. And if you can't get those patients to treatment, it makes no sense to screen them, period. Um, because then you're just creating anxiety and, and ill will and, and, and a death sentence without any sense of hope. I think the real issue is for us to understand what are the appropriate screening studies and how do we know if they're working. So prostate cancer is a good example. We've struggled through that. We've also struggled through breast cancer. What is the right age? What is the right type of screening? How much does the screening make a difference? And I think that's what you really want are not just to know that those patients have cancer, but can you change the natural history? And I think that's the real issue of finding a cancer early or finding a precancer early enough as in the case of anal cancer or cervical cancer, where a treatment will in fact hopefully make a difference in their survival. Next question. So in follow-up to the uh, inclusion criteria or the vulnerable subpopulation, I have a comment and in, in later on a question to, uh, regarding the HIV Global Fund. Um, FDA and ASCO had had a great workshop on the elderly, and they're proposing novel ways to get elderlies on trial. Um, they will, in part, probably recommend a, a separate elderly uh, study or a sub-study for many trials, ideally as companies want to avoid these very elderly as as they cause problems for their efficacy data, but have that separately done. And then the vulnerable population with comorbidities. Phase three trials cannot capture all comorbidities at sufficient numbers, even multiple phase three trials. So that's where we need large cohort studies. Um, ASCO's cancer link is one option, but um, as Gary Lyman and others have shown, the ICD coding doesn't capture the toxicities while even common toxicities. So we need prospective data collection and ASCO is starting to do that as well with canceling and there's other efforts going on. But I wanted to talk about the Global Cancer Fund or how it worked for HIV. Uh, is it, can you briefly describe how the HIV world has solved this problem of cancer costs globally and are most poor countries covered? Mm -hmm. 
So I'm no expert on global oncology, and it's a new field for me. Um, I remember years ago going to Mumbai. They have a HIV cancer conference every two years. And um, I would sit up in a podium like this, and people in the community would, the physicians would ask questions. And you know, usually they came down to give chemo, give HIV meds, and they said, well, we don't have those things here. And in one year, um, the, um, India suddenly developed three, new dr three drugs, which were um, variations on AZT, 3TC, and another drug. And it changed everything. And suddenly, I went back a few years later, and they were developing ways to get access for those medicines to the patients. Um, so those were huge things. Now, uh, Bush initiatives, Gates initiatives have made a huge difference in terms of developing infrastructure so that um, in many of the countries that we think about in Africa, um, it's changing in a really big way, although it's not completely there yet. And who's funding it? So what was done was the Clinton Foundation, the Gates Foundation, International Monetary Fund, all of them to, came together to create a fund, financial fund which bought drugs at a very low price and started distributing in Africa. So this was the way it was done. So there was a money which was created by all international financial agencies, including World Bank, International Monetary Fund, and everybody. So there was a fund available. So once the fund becomes available, then they outsource the low generic drugs, and they started distribution in Africa. And that is the way patients in Africa started using uh, retroviral drugs free of cost and at a regular interval like they did, like DOTS program for tuberculosis. And this is how they really control. The similar philosophy is being thought over. Last three years, there have been three meetings in Europe to, to convince all these monetary agencies to create a global cancer fund. So once this cancer fund becomes available, then one can think of really making anti-cancer drugs accessible in Africa. questions after the session, after this is done. So thank you. Uh, this is actually an answer, not a question. Uh, and the question was about screening for cancer. Once an individual patient is found, what do you do then? And what are the resources that are available for patients who have no access to care? Uh, one of the things that we did in Pennsylvania was uh, set up a collaboration between the Department of Health of the state uh, and our screening groups, such that the usual process for evaluation of a patient for Medicaid takes about three months, uh, but we were able to get a 24-hour review and a direct hotline to the Harrisburg uh, PA, uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, that is, evaluation for Medicare. Of Medicaid. So therefore, uh, getting these patients on Medicaid within 24 hours so that they can receive uh, additional diagnostic testing and subsequent treatment for cancer. So that's one area where we've had uh, success. And it may be that other states might want to um, try the same approach. That's at least good for the patients who qualify for Medicaid. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. So I just want to add to this early cancer detection issue. Zambia had done a great experiment about they have trained uh, paramedic staff in early detection of cervical cancer using VIA. But what they did was every unit which was doing early detection was supplied with a cryotherapy unit. So actually, if they were really detecting early lesions, they were using treatment at the same time. So this issue of detection and not treating, this was one of the ways they tried to resolve. 